Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Thursday edition of Experiential Learning Week at NKU. Thanks for being with us, and I uh, hope you can continue uh, through the week to follow uh, this uh, special uh, attention being given to experiential learning. Uh, I'm uh, Mark Nykirk. I direct the Scripps Howard Center for Civic Engagement at NKU. Uh, the center hosts the Marison Student Philanthropy Project, as well as other service learning initiatives, including our eight-year-old engagement in Newport, where we have four service learning classes active this semester. We're going to be talking today about Marison, which marked its uh, 20th uh, anniversary in 2020 and is the nation's model for experiential philanthropy. Uh, Northern is a leader in this uh, way of teaching. Uh, this has been an innovative year for Marison in part because of COVID and virtual classes. It's uh, interesting always to do something as hands-on as community engagement in a virtual world and our team, faculty, staff, students, and I might add also our nonprofits have met that challenge. But what you will learn about today are two classes that have taken innovation in their own directions and I'll let them tell, tell you about that, but I assure you their work is inspiring. We teach student philanthropy with service learning principles. And as many of you may know, service learning is a high impact practice, which simply means that it delivers benefits to students especially academic benefits. Students in these classes are more likely, for example, to remain enrolled and to graduate. In addition, students in these classes learn to be stewards of place, that is to be good citizens. They're more aware of needs in the community, how to address those needs, and they're more likely after graduation to volunteer at nonprofits, donate to nonprofits, and serve on nonprofit boards. We are able to do these classes because community donors invest in our students and in our classes so that our students can in turn invest in nonprofits in our community. So I would like to extend our thanks to our donors. You can see on the screen uh, their uh, names and uh, we are deeply appreciative to, for their support. We can't do this without them. I'd also like to thank our nonprofits. They are our co-educators. They um, take our students' calls, uh, They've been visiting classrooms this semester virtually, uh, but um, uh, they uh, really, in a very real way, help teach course content uh, and also, of course, um, enlighten our students about uh, the power of stewardship. So you will meet two of those nonprofits today, and I think you will enjoy uh, hearing from them. Before we get started, I just want to tell you a few numbers. Uh, student philanthropy classes don't happen in one or two colleges or just a few dis disciplines. In our 20 years, we've been in, in at least 45 disciplines. So this is a way of teaching that works across the university. We had over 6,000 students in our classes. They have invested nearly a million dollars in nonprofits. That's more than 400 nonprofits that have been assisted, most of them local. We assess our classes within the semester surveys and consistently show in positive impacts on students' learning and stewardship of 80 to 90%. This semester, we have 16 classes and 13 disciplines, and we're getting ready for the fall. So enough with the numbers. Let's get started. I'd like to introduce Dr. Kaisa Larson. Dr. Larson teaches Spanish at NKU, but she's also the faculty coordinator for the Marison Student Philanthropy Project and my partner in making sure this program goes well and that we help uh, faculty who want to do it, do it well. But Kaisa. Thank you, Mark, and thank you to our panelists who will be sharing their experiences today. Uh, as Mark mentioned, I teach Spanish at NKU. Uh, I'm also the faculty coordinator for the Marison Project across campus. And I have been lucky prior to um, the, my role as coordinator to incorporate the Marison Project in several of my advanced level classes. Currently, my role is to mentor faculty who are interested in incorporating our philanthropy program into their discipline. Faculty self-select to be part of this program, and they use the philanthropy, the philanthropy component to teach their class and their learning outcomes more deeply. Typically, each class is given $2,000 in grant money and the students collectively decide how to award this grant money to nonprofits in the local community. 
Each class can give one $2,000 grant or two $1,000 grants. That's the typical model, but we are also willing to experiment and we work with professors to assess how the Mayerson project can best fit with their discipline and the class learning outcomes. You will hear today about three sections of a course that incorporated the Mayerson project a little differently and they used crowdsourcing to raise funds for their nonprofit. But I won't spoil the surprise, but be prepared to be impressed. If there are faculty tuned in today and you've thought about teaching with philanthropy, I'd love to hear from you. Just send me an email, larsonk2 at nku.edu, uh, and we can set up a meeting to discuss that. Uh, without further ado, our first panelist, I'd like to introduce Reiko Osaki and her class to talk about their experience. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you for this opportunity to present about our experience. My name is Reiko Ozaki and I am an assistant professor in the School of Social Work. And I'm here today with our student, Lisa Bucket and uh, Executive Director of uh, Refugee Connect, Christian Burgoyne. And we're gonna share about our experience. But before I get started, I want to share my appreciation uh, for all of the donors who uh, gave through our crowdsourcing uh, campaign. And uh, we had 126 private uh, individual donors, uh, that's a lot. And then we also had a matching donor who made an impact early on in this um, um, campaign, Megan and Chris Cole. And uh, I also would like to thank uh, my college, College of Health and Human Services, for providing a pretty big, you know, very big amount uh, toward the end of the uh, campaign. That was a big surprise for me and I think everybody else as well. Uh, I also want to thank Mark, uh, Kaisa, and everybody involved in, the, uh, in this uh, Mayerson program. And also Andy Sharp and Amy Weil from Annual Giving, who really helped me through this first experience of doing Impact NKU. Um, so our, um, I, I feel like I need to say a little bit about social work first. So in, uh, so social work is a profession that's really uh, deeply connected to community. Uh, social workers historically helped advocated uh, for vulnerable and oppressed communities. And that tradition continues on today. And that's you know, where we are as Social Work 405, the class. And students learn how to work with communities in various ways. And uh, this particular course is part of the practice courses where the students learn about uh, ethics, uh, values, and some skill set theories, you know, stuff like that. And for this particular course, there are three main um, things, uh, competencies that we would like students to achieve uh, based on our, uh, you know, Council on Social Education uh, competencies. And that's also, uh, you know, connected to student learning outcomes. So engage diversity and difference in practice advanced human rights, economic and social justice, and also assess organizations and communities. So, you know, I could teach them how to do this by reading, lecturing, and all that kind of stuff. But it was always important for me to really give some hands-on experience. And uh, this is my fourth year teaching this course. And uh, I, when I first got this course, I knew that I wanted to partner with an agency. And I wanted to also expose students to a new community and diverse community, something that they don't know much about. And I really want, wanted them to feel a little bit uncomfortable, learn something completely new. So, and then with my personal experience of being an immigrant and, and also some of my professional experience of working with refugees, uh, through my social work career, uh, there was no, you know, uh, question in my mind to really reach out to refugee communities and refugee serving agencies. So 
I have partnered with Refugee Connect actually before Kristen joined Refugee Connect um, last year. And we tried kind of different ways to uh, give something to students as learning experience. But I also wanted to make sure the agency received something in return. For me, it was really important that it's, it's a win-win for both sides. I didn't want the agency to give so much and receive not much, you know. So anyway, so that was my thinking. And with the pandemic, I just have to think, hmm, what can I do? Um, what can I use to do this better? Um, and I knew about Mayerson programs. So I wanted to make sure that I, you know, I explore every possible ways of doing this. So I met with Mark and then I realized uh, Mayerson can be really flexible and have different ways of doing it. So we decided that we're gonna continue to partner with um, Refugee Connect. And then we decided that we're going to try to um, you know, do a fundraising for Refugee Connect. They have a lot of needs, so this is a perfect match. So I wanna show you uh, what the students actually did. If we can go to the website. So what Melanie is going to show you now is the actual fundraising page. So as you can see, uh, there are several uh, photos that students took and videos and all of these descriptions about the course, uh, students came up with it and they all came up with it as a team and I selected what sounded really good. So I did not write any of this. So the students by meeting with uh, Kristen uh, when she came to speak, with, uh, speak to them and they also met with a community member who talked about his own journey as a refugee. So all of these things, you know, gave, uh, you know, was impactful for students, I believe, and uh, they were able to, you know, uh, create a message that's really, you know, helpful for, uh, for the community. So you see some videos and pictures and uh, all of that. So students put a lot of work into it and uh, they also, you know, uh, contacted their personal contacts to solicit donations. So all of that, originally our goal was 3,600 and we actually ended up reaching 7,600 and we did not expect this. And I was told at the beginning of the semester by Impact NKU, uh, usually they suggest 2,500 as a um, uh, goal. But since I had over 90 students, I said, can we do like 30, uh, 3,600, and they said, reluctant, reluctantly, they said, sure, but we exceeded this um, uh, expectation very early on. So I was very impressed with the work my students did. So with that, I would like to give this to Lisa to speak about her experience as a student. And here are a lot of the other students. Hi everybody, my name is Lisa Beckett and as Dr. Ozaki said, I am one of her students for the BSW program. So I kind of tend to talk off the cuff and I talk a lot. So please feel free to stop me at any time because I just love talking to people. Um, this project has personally meant a lot to me because even before starting off as a social work student, I would never not speak out for somebody I saw being oppressed or being discriminated against. So when we first started talking in the beginning of class that we were doing this fundraiser for Refugee Connect, I was immediately excited. And this was something that's new but familiar for me. So it's familiar in the sense that I've worked for nonprofits for about two years now. So I have been doing some fundraising in that sense. New because I've not done it in a group collaborative kind of way. I had just always worked with the people in my nonprofit. When I first started, I was very hesitant to say the least because I've always described group work as trying to herd feral cats. You have to work with a lot of schedules. You have to work with a lot of people handling real life issues, trying to do something on the side. This 
really took me by surprise with how easy it was to connect with my group, how easy it was to connect with the people in my community. And they were all very supportive. One of the things that I want to mention when you're doing something like this, at least from my personal experience, you can't just put something out there and hope for the best. You have to be persistent. You have to constantly talk to your donors, tell them what you're fundraising for, and then reminding them that that fundraiser is still going. Hey, you know, I know we talked about this a week before, but I haven't seen your name on a donor wall. So that's what I ended up doing a lot of this project. I made a lot of hesitant friends, but it was for a very good cause. Refugee Connect is an amazing organization. I didn't know they existed until Dr. Ozaki introduced them to our class. And I'm just happy that we were able to be a part of it and able to make a difference to bring in a community navigator for the Northern Kentucky area. That's wonderful. Thank you, Lisa. Um, okay, so how about would you, um, Kristen, would you like to talk about your experience from uh, agency perspective? Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Ozaki. Um, first off, I just want to say that we are really grateful to the Meyerson Student Philanthropy Program, to Dr. Ozaki and her class of um, champion students and to all the donors who gave to this fundraiser uh, on behalf of the staff, the community navigators and the board of directors. We are just thrilled um, and really were very pleasantly surprised at um, the amount that this group was able to raise in such a short amount of time. Um, in a board meeting yesterday, we were actually talking about this fundraiser and how the board can use this as an example for their own fundraising efforts uh, in the future. Um, unfortunately, our program director is in another meeting that went over. She was hoping to join us as well, but she just wanted to make sure that you know how thrilled she is um, that you were able to uh, to do this fundraiser for Refugee Connect and how much the support of um, your funds mean to the community. Um, because of the amount that you were able to raise, we are uh, able to continue to offer this really valuable support service to refugees living in Northern Kentucky, um, which is an area, uh, a region that we are newly um, involved with in terms of our outreach efforts. Uh, Refugee Connect's mission is to connect refugees with resources to rebuild their lives as United States citizens. And our vision is that our collaborative network of resources and community navigators becomes the model for the successful integration of refugees. And we do that through really this cornerstone program of uh, a community navigator model, which is a new program for the organization. Um, this model was born out of the COVID-19 pandemic and the need for our organization to pivot from primarily in-school support services to a community-based model as the pandemic forced uh, the global shutdown. So we, uh, with some generous funds from a local foundation last March of 2020, were able to start um, our community navigator program and um, we have just been rapidly expanding since that time. Um, just to give you an idea of how effective this model has been um, in prior years before COVID-19, we typically served uh, through direct support about 100 youth and their families per year. Um, in the last year alone, we have, are up to 111 families, almost 300 school-aged children, and 500 individuals. And that number just grows on a daily basis as we develop uh, strong partnerships with local school districts um, and partner organizations in the community who really value the work of our navigators. What makes this community navigator program so unique is that it is one responsive to the needs of the family. So it is based on individualized support services um, that are really identified by the family. And secondly, our community navigators are representative of the populations that they support. All of them are either former refugees or immigrants themselves. 
Um, they have been here for a number of years and have really um, had a lot of experience uh, attempting to navigate these resources on their own. So they have that uh, lived experience that they bring to their work. And so that enables them to really understand um, where these families are and the challenges and barriers that they face when they're trying to access the existing resources that are available in the community. Uh, navigator's job is to work with the family to identify their needs um, and goals. And then their job is to identify resources and services in the community that provide the support to the families to help them really uh, be successful. Uh, we come uh, at our work from a strength-based perspective and we really um, value a, a person's right to self-determination. So our job is not really to tell you know, a family what they need or, or how they should go about accomplishing their goals or getting their needs fulfilled, but rather we listen to the family, give them options of various resources and then connect them to that resource. And um, we also identify strong partners in the community, whether it's nonprofit, healthcare providers, um, organizations that are doing financial literacy. And we work really strongly with those partners to ensure that their services are culturally responsive, trauma-informed, and that they're able to create welcoming spaces for the community. And really our uh, goal with this program is to connect people to resources and resources to the expertise and training that we can provide so that they are able to uh, create accessible pathways for services for everyone living in our community. Um, we, I uh, just kept refreshing this NKU <laughs> fundraising page um, as the month was going on. And um, I was so amazed uh, that with, I think it was within the first two weeks, the student group had reached its $3,600 goal and then just blown away that even beyond that, people continue to donate. So um, I uh, hope that one day I'm able to recruit some of these students to be board members for Refugee Connect. Um, I think that they have proven the power of friend raising and crowdsourcing and um, that you don't have to ask people for thousands of dollars that you uh, can really tap into your network um, and uh, get people excited about a topic or an organization um, who maybe didn't have previous knowledge of this population um, or the services that are provided to this population. Um, so again, we are just um, very thankful and grateful for all the hard work of these students um, and have had really hard conversations with our board of directors about fundraising um, to continue this really important program. Um, this funding will enable us to uh, provide um, funding for at least three navigators to continue this work through the rest of the year. Um, we have in our budget, they have reached about 30% of our fundraising goal for navigators for the year, um, just from the student groups. So um, yeah, I, that's all I have to say. Thank you so much. Well, that's amazing. Thank you so much, Kristen. I didn't realize. So our original goal was to fund one community navigator. Now we're able to fund three. That's amazing. And uh, a lot of the effort goes into Northern Kentucky. And I think that was really one of the concerns I had when I first started working with Refugee Connect and another agency actually originally, uh, that there really wasn't any resource available. And there was a resource earlier and that left the area. So there's a lot of concern that we've been talking about this. And I think um, our students were able to really, you know, uh, work really hard to, you know, fill that, uh, service needs gap. So that's amazing. So thank you so much. And I think that is it for our presentation. Righty. Hello, everybody. I'm Megan Downing. I'm assistant professor of organizational leadership in the College of Arts and Sciences in the Department of Political Science, Criminal Justice, and Organizational Leadership. But I also teach in the Honors College 
And this semester, um, I implemented the Marison Project in my Honors 102 course. And I wanna tell you just a little bit about Honors courses. Um, the the uh, a, a first year Honors course um, is for freshman students typically, and an Honors 102 course typically, the roster consists of second semester first year freshmen. And this year, the COVID year, these students graduated high school in the midst of COVID, then they started college in the midst of COVID. And I felt a, a significant responsibility, and I know a lot of my colleagues did too, to make this first year experience as engaging as possible to try to you know enrich the learning experience and i'm a big advocate for using mayerson in a classes and anybody here is thinking about it along with kaisa we, we would be well we would love to help you and guide you in that process um so at any rate mark i, I can't thank the scripps howard center enough for allowing me to do a very unique approach to the marison in this particular class we'll talk a little bit more about that and especially paul Gottbrath at be concerned our partner organization and the horizon community funds um, for supporting the project itself and then of course um kaisa and felicia we could never do what we do without you you're the glue that keeps everything together <laughs> but a little bit more about the class and in honors um, each section is a unique topic and the classroom embraces an inquiry-based learning strategy where the students are essentially leaders in their learning process and my job is to encourage that curiosity on the topic and guide them and the students actively engage in research form questions and they engage in really rich classroom discussion and information sharing related to our course topic and it really is a very engaging class even in a zoom environment in our section uh, servant leadership and civic engagement had no surprise to focus on civic engagement at its core. And I wanted to help them expand their understanding of what civic engagement was beyond political involvement to the community level engagement, direct service, philanthropy, advocacy, or advocacy and education and such. Um, as well as exploring the concept of servant leadership, which is, you know, embraces listening, leadership from a listening and empathy, uh, focusing on healing, awareness, persuasion, as well as stewardship and being able to conceptualize need, being committed to growth and building community. So we focused on how each individual can have a community impact how everyone has a capacity to make a difference in their community, that leadership itself is not tied to a title or a position or power, that we can, we can each lead and influence and make a contribution. So the students in the class, they learned about the essential role of community local nonprofits and the volunteers that make up those nonprofits to make sure that the work gets done, and so much more through a series of guest speakers, including our Mayerson Project funders from the Horizon Community Fund, which is a local nonprofit itself that helps other nonprofits by funding important community based initiatives. Uh, to Tori Vogelsang from Kentucky Campus Compact, who spoke to the students and helped them understand the breadth of volunteer opportunities that are available to them, as well as the process of how to organize and identify community talent and leverage that, bringing that talent together to implement a project, and which is something they did themselves as they did their work. Um, Dr. Jessica Taylor came and spoke from our own Fuel NKU. She's a social work professor at NKU, and she shared the story of how Fuel and Fuel NKU project grew from her recognition of a single student's need and a shelf of snacks in her office to the highly effective food pantry and student support resource that we have today, um, all because of that listening, that servant leadership approach. And then especially Paul Gottbrath from Be Concerned, who visited, and as again, our partner from the nonprofit, and he helped the students to connect the dots across what they learned from each guest speaker. Um, you know, of course, he visited as a guest himself via Zoom to tell the Be Concerned story and the work that they do and the challenges they face and met head on during the pandemic. And he also outlined four particular projects that they are working on this year. And the students researched and discussed these. And as a class, they op opted to focus their energies on two particular projects. Um, I think that we have them on the slide, a couple of images of some of the work that the students have done, um, the Erlanger Food Pantry and the be concerned hunger walk. Um, and so I wanna put in a shameless plug actually for the hunger walk because the students are recruiting on behalf of be concerned, encouraging people to sign up for the hunger walk, which is something that's 
it's organized through the, um, the, the food bank, but um, each individual nonprofit can have their own team. And so we're encouraging people, please sign up to be on the Be Concerned Hunger Walk team. You can scan the QR code or email me at downingm.nku.edu and I'll guide you on how to sign up. But um, the funds would then support this very important uh, resource in our community that Paul will tell you a little bit more about. But the, the students work collaboratively and leverage their individual talents and you know in honors we have students from all across campus all different kinds of majors and they they brought their work to the table and worked very hard to uh, to bring awareness to these two important projects and typically we would research these projects and figure out where we're going to give the grant but with Paul's guidance and his in, uh, inspiration the students were actually able to do service and do this work for be concerned while also um, advocating for the programs and so ultimately they they um, elected to award the grant funds to support the Erlanger Food Pantry, um, but they have really enjoyed and will continue doing work uh, for Be Concerned, even beyond exam period. That, that's how dedicated they are to this. They're going to participate virtually or in their own areas in the Hunger Walk on Memorial Day and send pictures to Be Concerned. So without further rambling from me, I want to turn it over to the students who are going to share a little bit about the impact this project has had on their learning experience. So we'll start with Jonah Krebs, who I'm so glad is with us today, and then followed by Grace McCon. Hi everyone, my name is Jonah Krebs and I'm in my first full year here at NKU and I'm right now currently a general business pre-major in the College of Business and the Honors College and down the road I'm looking at studying accounting or finance but that's for another day. So my group along with one other group worked to help raise uh, support for the virtual hunger walk for Be Concerned. And the, as Dr. Downing said, the Hunger Walk is held on Memorial Day each year. It's a 5K held downtown and food pantries from all over the Northern Kentucky and greater Cincinnati area meet and they host to raise money to uh, support local food pantries and share ideas and build this, that sense of community. And this was very apparent to us as soon as Paul came and talked to our class. Uh, my group, we were really focused on wanting to help be concerned in the best way possible. And we did this through helping share our ideas with Paul and uh, listening to his ideas on how we could help be concerned through raising money for the virtual hunger walk. And we primarily accomplished this through creating posters and flyers that we shared within our communities and on our social media pages, as well as just with other NKU groups in general. I know uh, the other group that was working on the Hunger Project or the Hunger Walk did a lot of work to with certain um, groups and organizations on at NKU. And while we had a lot of success and it was very apparent and clear to what our goals were, we still face a couple challenges along the way, just with the online environment. And we we even had some ideas that we shared with Paul and Paul was really excited about, but unfortunately the logistics of it just didn't pan out too well. And we were sad that they didn't work, but we knew we could still help make an impact and a difference for Be Concerned. And we're excited for the coming month up until Memorial Day to try and help Be Concerned and we were really just amazed at how Be Concerned makes such a big impact on the Northern Kentucky area. I believe on one of the flyers, it says that one in every seven people in Northern Kentucky is food insecure. And throughout our work with Paul, he shared a lot of information with us and showed us just how much of an impact Be Concerned has. So it was easy to get excited and to be encouraged to work with the Marison project and be concerned specifically. So I'm very grateful I had this experience and I'm looking forward to my own virtual hunger walk down the road as we get to Memorial Day. Hi everyone, my name is Grace McCon and I'm an integrative studies major 
which basically combines economics with marketing and professional writing, but I'm kind of in the same boat as Jonah. I'm not sure if I'll keep that or switch it up, but we'll see in the future. So I was one of two groups in Dr. Downing's class that worked on the Erlanger Food Pantry project for Be Concerned. And when Paul came to talk to us early in the semester, he had explained that they've had a Covington location that has been operating and serving the community for several, several years now. But as for the Erlanger Pantry, it's fairly new, about three years old. So there really hasn't been much publicity um, so our goal was really just to spread the word about the Erlanger Food Pantry so that we can serve more citizens and especially Boone County residents. So we started off thinking about how exactly we could achieve this goal of spreading the word and we talked to Paul about it. We had thought about maybe helping improve their social media pages, creating flyers, creating brochures. Um, and we ultimately ended up going the brochure flyer route just because that's something that we can repost on our personal social medias and also hang up in the respective areas where we wanna reach more community members. And I did try to reach out to someone from the Boone County Recorder to get a piece published, but it's, I was having some trouble finding people just because print media is kind of not as popular as it was anymore. And I did reach out to someone, but they re didn't respond. But we do have a ton of brochures and flyers that we made as a class and will be printed by the Scripps Howard Center to hang up around the area. So um, this class, along with having the privilege to work with Be Concerned, it was also really did fulfill the experiential learning requirement because our class is called Servant Leadership and Civic Engagement. And Be Concerned definitely taught me more about both servant leadership and civic engagement. So what's really unique about Be Concerned is how they treat their customers like one big family. And yes, they call the people that go there to get food their customers. They're so respectful towards them, never want to make them feel any less or belittle them in any way. So all customers have the privilege or no not the privilege they um they get to choose the food exactly what they want they're never handed a care package with already selected choices for them they want to give them that freedom of choice to choose what they want so even in covid in the covington location they did a car pickup service where they would fill out an order sheet and then all the customer or all the volunteers would go and get the exact food they wanted. So it's just um, that servant leadership I really learned. It just means putting the community before yourself. And it's not like traditional leadership where the leader is kind of on top and then everyone's working for him. It's the complete opposite. Like the goal is really to serve and build a community. And then for the civic engagement aspect, I just learned that it is so important to get involved no matter how big of a contribution you're making because I've grown up in Boone County my whole life. I've had always had a stable household, you know, three meals a day. And I just figured everyone else that lived in Boone County was just like me. But I actually learned that Boone County actually has a lot of low income residents that aren't getting the proper services they need because everyone else assumes the same thing that there were more well off county over here in Boone County. So I've just learned that volunteering really is important so that these nonprofits can stay afloat and we can serve our community members so that that's just a burden off them and they can focus on other things like paying their bills and things like that and they don't have to worry about getting food because Be Concerned is always there ready to help. And and then ultimately this pro experience taught me some teamwork skills because we had to work with a team over Zoom and that had its challenges, but it really taught me some good communication skills and we were all able to have a successful project in the end. And while both, team, both um, teams, the Hunger Walk and the Erlanger Food Pantry worked very hard and we it was very, 
um, rewarding experience for both of us. Our class ultimately was in 100% agreement to award the $2,000 grant to the Erlanger Food Pantry to support their mission in the Boone County and surrounding areas. So this has been a really beneficial learning experience and I'm so happy that we all got to work with Be Concerned and I look forward to continuing to work with them in the future. Thank you. So hello everyone, I'm Paul Gottbreath. I'm the Grants Director at uh, Be Concerned, former uh, Executive Director here. Um, I wanna start by saying some thanks here and uh, first, uh, first to the Meyerson uh, Foundation uh, for starting this program within KU and to the other funders who helped support it through the years. Uh, from the statistics that Mark shared with us earlier about students uh, are more likely to graduate or more likely to be involved later in life with it. It sounds like uh, the aims of the program are certainly being uh, met, the promise of it is cer certainly being met. So, um, and I wanna thank Dr. Downing for her innovative approach to uh, picking us uh, for this grant. Um, um, I think that was the, one of the great benefits of that was that uh, we were uh, we had a lot more time to engage with the students and we made the most of it. I think we were constantly going back and forth with communications. Um, we had an in-depth uh, opportunity to uh, explain our program to the kids and and uh, and I'm sorry if I call you kids, but <laughs> yeah, the students. Um, so uh, that was really a, a positive uh, uh, part of, of the whole program for us. It's just been a very positive uh, experience for us and we've been involved in lots of uh, uh, Myerson grants and um, always had a, a great um, uh, outcome from them. So uh, a little bit about Be Concerned. Uh, we've been around as an organization for 53 years. Uh, for the last 37 years, we've been a food assistance organization. Um, as um, Grace said, we primarily were have been in Covington for most of that time, but uh, we did uh, get into Erlanger in 2019. Um, that program had been operated by United Ministries and was uh, struggling and faced a very uncertain future. So we were in talks with them for a year and finally uh, agreed to uh, merge with them and take over that program. Um, one of the reasons that we did that was because as uh, Grace was talking about Boone County, there is a lot of unmet need there. It is the most underserved county in all of Northern Kentucky uh, for food resources. And so the Erlanger uh, campus affords us and, and ideal uh, spot from which to uh, increase uh, our service to Boone County. Um, so uh, the grant will be used uh, for food, as simple as that, for food for the Erlanger Pantry, um, which before we took it over was um, serving about fewer than uh, 300 families a month. And in 2020, we averaged uh, 366 families a month. So. We've already uh, made an impact there, uh, kind of uh, had to uh, do some uh, culture building there to uh, refocus on the uh, customer there. And uh, we, talk, as Grace said, we do call them customers. Um, and um, so we, um, we um, are hopeful to build that program in the future and, and the resources that the students have developed, the, the brochures and the flyers and everything will be um, helpful to us as we go forward in, in the future and uh, in, increase our presence there and find other families. There are lots and lots, there's hundreds of families there, I think that probably could use our services. And, and we're, uh, we know that this experience with uh, Dr. Denning's class will help us uh, to move forward on that, on that uh, toward that goal quite a bit. Um, and I, and I just want to say thanks again to the students. Uh, they were just, uh, they were wonderful. They were, uh, from the first time we met with them, they were, there was energy and there was excitement. There was a buzz about the class. And, uh, you know, I was thinking, first thing I thought was, wow, these are freshmen. They, <laughs> that's phenomenal. And the thec second thing I thought was, uh, wow, the, if these students are the future of, of uh, uh, nonprofit uh, support and engagement, then we're in very good hands. So thank you for this opportunity to tell you a little bit about Be Concerned and to, uh, and to really uh, uh, rave about the experience that we had this year with Dr. Downing and her students. Thank you.
thank you so much, Paul, and, and everybody else for that matter. So I wanted, this is our moment to uh, post questions in the chat. And I see that there is already one great question from Lisa for Grace. Uh, so the question is, Grace, I appreciate you sharing how this widened your perspective of food insecurities in Northern Kentucky. And from your work on these projects, what, uh, what are the ways that we can educate others who may not know about food insecurities, about the needs and how they can help meet the needs? Do you have any thoughts? On yeah, that. so that's actually a great question. So we did have another guest speaker earlier in the year who works for the Horizon Community Funds of Northern Kentucky. And her name is Tess Brown. And she is actually an expert in marketing. That's kind of her niche. So she was explaining, I think, well, before I start rambling, I think social media is a really great way to spread the word just because everyone's on it. And I know like TikTok is like kind of a younger thing, I guess, but she was talking about how like that's, you have to kind of know your social media, like what the purpose is. So like on TikTok and Instagram, that would be more for the purpose of like trying to go viral and spread the word, like building awareness. And then places like Facebook are going to be more for like fundraising and things like that. So really just, I think social media one is a great way to spread the word because pretty much everyone has it. And then two, you have to, if you want to use social media, you need to understand what the purposes of each different platform is. Um, and then, so I think another aspect was that there has to be like a storytelling element. If you want people to like donate or um, things like that, or learn more about food insecurity. So if you just say, please donate $20, people are gonna be less likely to donate. But if you say, please donate $20 to help um, a family in need get fresh produce for the week, then that might incline them to donate a little bit more. So yeah, just taking advantage of social media. And then she also talked about, um, there's a lot of like underground Facebook groups that will like help each other out. Um, like she mentioned the Good Samaritans of Northern Kentucky and they'll, go on Facebook and say, I don't have anywhere to sleep tonight. Can someone bring me a blanket? And then that person will bring them a blanket. So, and also getting into those underground groups and spreading the word, hey, I have a place for you, be concerned. That's another great way to just kind of spread, spread all the greatness that Be Concerned does and just get the word about food insecurity out there. That's awesome. Thank you so much. And if um, for the panelists, if you wouldn't mind turning on your cameras, I should have said that earlier. And this question can be brought into uh, any of our panelists. Does there anyone else that would like to offer some insights into this? I do just want to throw one more thing out there is that the students, one more thing that we are going to try to do. So everybody send us positive vibes because, you know, technology. But next Thursday, after they do their research presentations, we're going to take, we're going to try using the end of the class and we're going to try to record a Zoom where everyone says something to try to motivate people to support the, the hunger walk and or the food pantry. So we'll see how it goes. That's our plan. <laughs> so many creative ideas. Thank you. Um, feel free to raise your hand or, or if are there any additional questions, uh, you can type them in the chat as well. Well, I have one that I could ask. So this is for the students again, any student. Uh, so just kind of a general question, thinking about your experience this semester with the Mayerson Project. If, what would you say to another student about taking a class with philanthropy, uh, the Mayerson Project or a philanthropy component, experiential learning, uh, and especially maybe a student who might be hesitant about this, possibly perceived extra work or um, out of class work? 
I would say it really just opened my eyes to how many people want to make an impact on Northern Kentucky and our community. All of our guest speakers really blew me away from uh, Dr. Downing's class, starting with Paul. I mean, he, he gave us a bunch of numbers and told us about how big and how much of an impact Be Concerned has and how they're trying to expand to do more. Uh, the Horizon Community Funds speaker, Tess Brown, really, she, I was really amazed at the numbers she was uh, throwing at us, considering they were such a young nonprofit and had already given millions of dollars in grants to Northern Kentucky and all the different groups that they had. So uh, the philanthropy project really just helped open my eyes to the bigger Northern Kentucky community and uh, especially outside of Campbell County because I've spent most of my life here in Campbell County. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, I would just say definitely go for it because it's very much, um, it is a different experience than just your regular course because in a regular course, you kind of just, I mean, you learn about the things and maybe watch some videos about the topic, whatever you're discussing, but then that's kind of it and then you move on. But in an experiential learning class, it's kind of like a two for one because you get to take a class and you also get to um, volunteer and get out in the community. So if you're already planning on volunteering anyway and you like being involved in the community, you might as well take a class and do get credit and do that at the exact same time. Wonderful, thanks. Is there anybody else that would like to offer some insight? One of the biggest things that I want to mention, and it applies to a lot of things in life, is if you walk in with a certain mindset, like it's going to be too difficult, that's really a lot of what you're going to get out of it. Um, if you go in open-minded and willing to learn something new and try something new, it's going to be a much more positive experience. I love the hands-on piece because it applies directly to what I do in the field of social work. But like the students, the other students in here, they're not doing social work and they found a way to find value in it. So I think it's really something everyone should experience. I definitely agree. I'm going, I'm going to pick on somebody, but I, I don't, if you don't want to talk, Samantha, you don't have to. But Samantha was in my Honors 101 class last semester and did a more traditional Marison project then. And then I believe she was in Dr. Ozaki's class this semester, if I'm not, correct me if yes, I'm wrong. Yes, so I have no here. idea, Sam. So, so there you are, Sam. And so <laughs> why don't you share your thoughts about being in a Marison's back-to-back -back from two different approaches? And, and yeah, that's cool. And I'll, I'll add to this because there's another question in the chat that could be a good, um, a good add on to this, but uh, Lisa asked to the, all the students, uh, what skills did you develop or hone as a part of these projects and how do you plan to use these skills in the future? So you could also think about, you know, your first time teaching Mayerson and your second time and maybe um, what skills did you acquire and uh, continue to learn? Yeah, so I enjoyed the experiential learning um, because I am a hands-on kind of learner. Um, I do better with like actively doing something rather than, oh, let's just read a textbook and take a test. I don't learn that way. And so this has been, um, for both classes, it's been really a neat way to do it. Um, I do I do feel like it's different in both ways um, because I, like with this second one, I feel like I've had more of a personal impact where I am actively reaching out to people um, that I know and posting um, like on, my social media, reaching out via email and things like that. Um, so I feel like I've had a more personal sort of approach to it, but um, you know, with Dr. Downing's more traditional approach, I feel like I got a good kind of background in how um, like fundraising and um, just kind of 
working on how a uh, organization works and how a nonprofit functions. And I think that that class helped to lead me into Dr. Ozaki's class so that then I knew how the nonprofits kind of work and how things um, function. So then I was more prepared to do the fundraising myself um, for that class. That's fabulous. And do the students have any thoughts on voting? So voting, I know from the faculty perspective, it's you know a really big day uh, when your class gets to that moment where you have to make some of those decisions. And so, would you like to share any thoughts on you know the voting process? How did you make your selections? Um, was there a heated debate, for instance? Um, how did how did the class hash out a, a plan for what what to do? I can just say that this, I think this applies for both Dr. Ozaki's class and mine this semester, that that wasn't actually much of an issue because we we did things in the very non-traditional way. So the voting in, in my class was about choosing between one of two projects at an organization already. And, and Dr. Ozaki was fundraising for an organization they'd selected. For those of you that don't um, haven't uh, experienced one of these sessions talking about mayors and typically you're looking at multiple organizations and 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 in some way it's connected to the learning outcomes and then um, either the students or the organizations themselves are advocating for re perhaps receiving the grant they complete an application um, and then the students evaluate those so in my class that uh, Sam was in in the in the fall each student group researched, interviewed, and then did a class presentation on behalf. They were advocating for the organization they had selected to do a deep dive into learning about the processes of the organizations and such. And then, um, and that class was looking at leadership from four different broad perspectives, including community engagement and philanthropy. So at any rate, uh, the, after they present, then they have to select. And so we use a ranked voting choice in order to not constantly have a four-way tie. <laughs> so the students then um, you know, rank the organizations that they think are most qualified meeting the criteria that we've agreed upon in the class that are important to consider. And last semester, we were focusing on a community support during the COVID crisis. And it is how we first actually learned about and got connected with Paul. Um, and although Paul's organization wasn't selected in that class in the fall, I was so impressed by the work that they were doing and how, and Dan Hansert in Covington told me how they just hit the ground running um, during the COVID crisis when people were afraid to grocery shop and afraid to do, and people that were in need that had never been in need before. And Paul can speak to how their numbers in Covington just exploded with the number of families that they, and they did it. They could have shut down, but they said, we're not going to, we're going to continue to do our work. And as Dr. Ozaki and I were talking the other day, that's what you do when you serve the community. That's what you do when you're in social work, you find a way and they found a way to continue to do as Grace said and, and treat their, their um, participants as cu the customers, allowing them to still have that selective process um, and continue to feel valued and not feel less than, especially those that were new to needing kind of support in this crisis situation. So it, it was an outstanding experience for the students, but it's always an outstanding experience for the faculty as well. It is a little bit more work, but it's absolutely worth every minute of it. Thanks so much. Well, we are pretty much out of time. We have one more question that was posted to the chat about obstacles. Uh, so what obstacles did your class face? How did you overcome them? And perhaps uh, we could pass this to Reiko as the first time that you taught Mayerson uh, and how it in this unusual uh, semester, do you have any closing thoughts on oh uh, how God. that went or, or and or advice for other one <laughs> other faculty? Okay, closing. Oh my goodness, that's a big um, honor. Um, so this is the first time using this uh, Mayerson format. And, but I really think that I didn't experience any obstacles because I was using Mayerson or doing this fundraising. The only thing was that I have never done this before. I didn't know anything about impact NKU. 
Um, but every step of the way, somebody was available to help. Like uh, I was in contact, contact with people uh, who run Impact NKU like Andy Sharp. And then there is Felicia and everybody, Kaisa, Mark, um, you know, uh, from the mayor some part. So I think that NKU has a really good foundation to support uh, experiential uh, learning, uh, service learning for the students by supporting faculty members to do this. So if anybody is interested, I think that uh, there's nothing to worry about. You are still, the faculty members are still responsible for knowing what the, you know, goals of the courses are and if how to, you know, uh, put them together with Mayo some components. But, um, you know, even with that, I think people are there to help you to think through those kinds of things. So, Thanks, so, thank you so very much, Mark. Do you have last, last thoughts? Uh, well, just to thank you to everybody and especially uh, thank you to the students. It's always good to hear uh, what your classroom experience uh, was like. And uh, uh, thanks also to uh, uh, the our nonprofit partners. Honestly, we can't do this with, without you. Uh, it, as Kaisa said earlier, if there are any faculty members uh, in, uh, with us today who want to teach this, please reach out to us. Uh, I always like to think of Marison as you imagine uh, trying to build a neighborhood and we say we, we make five foundations and they're all the same size and then we get five different architects and say build a house. The house houses will all look a little different and we uh, you are our architects for those houses. Uh, so we want to have some creativity on how we do the program and we're happy to work with, with you on all that. Um, so I said at the beginning, uh, Service learning is a high impact practice. And I think uh, over the past hour, you see uh, just what high impact looks like, uh, uh, both from a faculty uh, perspective and a student perspective, as well as the benefits to the community. So thanks for being with us and celebrating experiential learning at NKU and have a good afternoon.